Well, good morning and welcome. I'm delighted to be your host today. My name is Amy Koo. I serve as Executive Director of the Domestic and Global Engagement Program for Providence. I, I am just delighted that we're going to have a little bit of time to talk about uh, the issues impacting our communities, some of the vulnerable populations that organizations in our communities are serving. And so we're, we are joined today by Dr. Rachel Solotaroff, President and CEO of Central City Concern, Aaron McGuire, Regional Network Builder at Catholic Community Services of Western Washington, Sherry Williams, Regional Director of Community Health Investment at Swedish, and Joseph Eichter, Director of Community Health Investment at Providence. So thank you to each of our panelists for taking some time this morning to have this conversation and, and sharing with us a bit about your work. Before we dive in uh, and, uh, and perhaps in Providence tradition, I'd like to get started with a, a short reflection. And my reflection is by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. He states, courage is an inner resolution to go forward despite obstacles. Cowardice is submissive surrender to circumstances. Courage breeds creativity. Cowardice represses fear and is mastered by it. Cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience, conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when we must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. Sometimes we forget of how unpopular Dr. King was during his time. He was imprisoned nearly 30 times. He was under surveillance by the FBI for 15 years in which they tried to discredit him personally through threats and political maneuvering. And you can juxtapose that with today's popularity in which he is one of the most inspiring people by most Americans. But yet in 1968, 75% of Americans disapproved of Dr. King. His vision for the beloved community involved anti-poverty, anti-racism, and anti-militarism to create a society based on the marriage of justice, equal opportunity, and love of one's fellow human beings. And so before we begin, I'd just like for us to take a moment to consider the work of, of these, these incredible organizations and, and the tremendous work of the protesters and community organizers who are moving forward such critical conversations of racial equity and institutionalized racism at the time. Let us, as we consider the start of this conversation, celebrate their courage, the urgency to which they are work, and the focus on what is not just popular, but what is right. Thank you for joining, and I look forward to our conversation here. To each of our panelists, thank you for joining. I've shared with each of them that I feel like we could spend an hour talking about their respective work and organizations. But I'm really just so delighted that you're here today to share some of that incredible work with our audiences and some of the insights that you've gained in working in the community. Um, we've included each of you because you have had to pivot some of the work that you do uh, in extraordinary ways to meet the needs of, of vulnerable populations at this time. And so as we get started with some questions, I'm gonna start with Dr. Solotaroff. Uh, Rachel, you've been a longtime friend of, of Providence's and, and partner of our organization. Perhaps you can start by sharing with us just a little bit about how you've had to reshape programs and shift your programs to respond to the community need uh, the Central City Concern has seen experience during this time of COVID. You bet. Thanks, Amy. Thanks for having me here today. Thanks for that wonderful reflection and the context. Really, really uh, helpful. Um, 
For those of you who don't know, Central City Concern is an organization um, in Portland, Oregon. We serve the greater Portland community whose mission is to provide comprehensive solutions to ending homelessness. Um, and in the service of that mission, sort of foster and maintaining human connection is really at the heart of what we do, whether it's building community in housing folks, um, providing people with um, uh, sort of person-centered, trauma-informed, often culturally specific mental health addictions care or primary care, um, working with folks to build their confidence and skills to get employment, and also working closely with our clients and our community to support advocacy and to mobilize for change. So a lot of our services and programs um, and even buildings are designed pretty intentionally to foster that human connection. And you can imagine that something like COVID, which then asks us to physically distance and to see one another as little as possible has been really challenging for our clients, but also for our staff to show up and do what they want to do. Um, I think another really significant driver of how we've needed to respond and shift is the issue of racial disparities in homelessness in particular. Um, in Portland and everywhere in this country, people of color make up a disproportionate um, amount of those individuals experiencing homelessness compared to the general population. And that's a function of uh, systemic racism in our criminal justice system, in our housing policies, in how healthcare is delivered or not delivered at all, in how we hire and promote people in jobs. So with that, I wanted to give you sort of a broad framework of where we come from to tell you just a couple of things that we've been doing to try to um, shift and adapt and meet people where they are um, over the last few months. And even um, we can talk a bit more later over the last few weeks. Um, like many organizations, we've moved to what we're calling teleconnections, not just telehealth. Um, so being able to do as much as possible by video and by phone. And you really have to take into account where your clients are when you're doing that. We've, um, with the support of many organizations, Providence among of them, um, needed to provide phones or been able to provide phones, video access, broadband, but also making sure that people have a safe space in which to talk and connect. That might be um, coming into our office to do something remotely. It might be um, brainstorming with a counselor or a case manager where to go. We've created some telesuites in which people can connect. Um, we've also found that the absence of connection has made it harder for people to stay within programs. So for instance, we have a program for um, moms, either pregnant women or mothers with substance use disorder and residential treatment, and her their inability to connect with their kids, who, some of whom are in treatment with them, but some of whom may not be, has jeopardized their ability to stay. So part of, the, in treatment, so part of the teleconnections is finding ways that they can connect with their, with their kids, or even working with some of our state policies to allow those visitors, even though there are no visitor policies. Um, we've done a lot of outreach that we, we do outreach anyway, but in a new way to clients to um, provide food, to deliver medications that they couldn't pick up otherwise, either because folks are actually in isolation because they've come in contact with someone who has COVID or um, uh, maybe symptomatic themselves, um, or they're just justifiably fearful to get out. We've also found we work a lot with individuals exiting the criminal justice system, coming out of jail or prison, and there have been a lot of systemic barriers to those folks being able to get access to the resources they need. Just having the DMV being closed and people being unable to get IDs makes it then harder to get housing, to access benefits, to apply for jobs. So we've done advocacy with our um, state and DMV just to be able to get some appointments for people to um, access those resources. And then just providing, again, knowing the disproportionate impact on Black, Indigenous, and um, people of color of COVID itself, trying to do as much education and outreach um, as possible to those communities to make um, exceptions for our own staff and clients who um, <clears throat> have folks at home who may be um, ill, 
and having lots of wonderful donations of cloth masks, which are not um, always accessible to everyone to be able to distribute people so that they can be as active as possible. Amazing. I cannot imagine how much of your programs you've really had to mold um, in the midst of this time and in the midst of doing such critical work for the community. Uh, so thank you for that context and, and, and start to our conversation. Erin, I'd like to turn it over to you uh, with a similar question. I know we've had many conversations about the, the ways in which Catholic Community Services has had to shift to its housing programs to make it more safe for, for at-risk populations. Uh, could you share with us a little bit more and provide some context about the ways that you've had to pivot programs and, and perhaps personally how you've had to shift the ways that you've worked in the community? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Amy, and thanks to everybody. It's, it's really a it's really special for me to be a part of such a panel and to talk about some of the work that we've been doing. Um, I'll specifically talk about our homelessness population that we work with in Seattle and King County. Um, at Catholic Community Services, we have nearly a dozen shelters in the Seattle region and throughout King County. Um, many of those shelters are what you would call congregate settings. Um, so these are churches, big buildings, different settings where we pull out mats and put them on the floor. Um, and these mats, unfortunately, were very, um, very close together, um, typically around six inches together, our mats. Um, so when the health of our community really demanded us to look at how are we going to physically distance those folks that we were working with in our shelters, um, we really started to look at how could we proactively separate our shelters and proactively isolate some folks. Um, that began with us, you know, first looking at our data and seeing how many people do we have that were 60 or older or in those vulnerable populations. Um, unfortunately, we had hundreds and hundreds of people who were 60 or older. So we first began in mid-March um, putting people who were over the age of 80 into hotels. Um, so that's kind of how we were needed to start. And we started to place people over the age of 80. And then we also started to place families who had medically fragile children. Um, so we began to do that. Um, and over the last few months, we've progressively been able to add more and more people into hotels. Um, we currently have folks in five different hotels across the county um, for a total of probably around 225 individuals and then 75 families that are living in hotels. Um, moreover, we have really thrown up our existing shelter system and creatively tried to think of new ways that we can shelter folks that aren't in this congregate model. Um, that has included um, using other spaces for shelter so that we can separate people out and either have physical barriers when people are sleeping or with distances of hopefully six to 12 feet apart and mats. Um, so we have opened up shelters in um, vacant airports, um, in vacant community centers, um, in vacant schools, in churches, in places that we <laughs> really never imagined. Um, we're trying to quickly move people and have them become much more um, safe so that they can isolate and quarantine um, and the, the safety and physical distance that many people who are housed have benefited from. Um, the other thing that we have done is that a lot of our shelters have been just overnight shelters. So meaning that at night, you know, maybe around 8 p.m., they sleep and then they leave the next morning at 8 a.m. Um, but we have turned all of our sites into 24 7 sites. This is really, um, we've responded by, you know, having staff be there 24 7, having all of our services, partnering with other people so that we can provide case management, behavioral health, nursing on site. People aren't having to go into the community. Um, we are working really hard to provide meals for people and that, that's, you know, where Amy and um, and really a huge blessing to be able to partner with Amy and, and all the folks to provide those comfort kits. Um, because one of the struggle was if we weren't providing meals for folks 
during the day, they were going out into the community and then risking, um, you know, risking exposure at that point. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's a little bit of an overview, Amy, hopefully. Yeah, yeah thank you, Erin, thank you. And, um, and, and I, I know that there's been um, just such a, a tremendous effort to look at some of that housing and think about it in a long-term way uh, because um, it's, it's a way of supporting our homeless populations that's perhaps um, uh, more, more compassionate, more dignified uh, in its approach. So I, I look forward to hearing a little bit more about that. And I, I know you guys have been working with farm workers as well. So um, a lot more to explore both with Central City Concern and with Catholic Charities. But thank you ladies for, for some of that context to get started. Sherry, uh, similar but perhaps different question for you. And uh, of course, working within the healthcare system, uh, your position to partner with organizations all throughout Western Washington and the Seattle market specifically. Um, would love to hear a little bit about how Swedish has had to pivot community programs to better meet those needs and, and, and partner in ways that are really supporting some of those community efforts. Well, thank you. Thank you, Amy. And I also want to just thank you for um, messaging Dr. Martin Luther, Martin Luther King's words and then also bringing the Black Lives Matter demonstrations in March into meetings um, and having a little bit of space for people to recognize what's happening um, in our city and our county and our state and across the United States and in other countries. So thank you for recognizing that. And, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, gosh, you know, Swedish has done an incredible pivot with regards to outreach and engagement around the COVID-19 uh, virus and how we connect with our community partners. Um, we really, around March 11th, we sat down with our staff and identified a way to uh, do a discernment to determine what community partner organizations are or in the greatest need. Uh, so we went through our 120 nonprofit organizations and bucketed them in housing, food insecurity. We looked at domestic violence organizations, mother and baby organizations that support parenting. We also looked at seniors and substance abuse organizations. And with our community benefit dollars, we developed a resiliency fund and allocated a total of $100,000 to 10 organizations that focus in on those areas that was the greatest need. Uh, we had them also think deeply about pivoting as well. We asked them to look at the immediate need and response for their community clients and um, able to really focus in on what is the need within the next 15 to 25 days and was able to allocate, allocate between five and $10,000 to these organizations. And it was an incredible relief for them uh, because of the stay at home order, knowing that there were some, a lot of unknowns and to be able to funnel some um, immediate dollars so these organizations could either buy, buy product or develop systems and put them in place. So that was one incredible pivot that we had based on our relationships and our, uh, with our nonprofit organizations. Uh, we also looked at what is the greatest community need with regards to volunteers. We developed this COVID donation line where we reached out to community individuals, asking them, do they would like to, would they like to volunteer? And we were able to identify a specific project where community volunteers can work from home or work outside of the hospital to support patient populations. So we developed this grocery a program where volunteers were um, vetted, that we provide PPE with them, we connected them with their uh, social worker and really developed a process where individuals could have, a, a, with a donation from our foundation, um, go to the grocery store with a list and deliver those groceries to our patient populations who are considered homebound. So that was an incredible way to pivot and use our community resources in a very meaningful way. We've also worked real closely with uh, King County Public Health in the Community Response Clinic, uh, where we had um, COVID screening and testing supporting majority of the homeless shelters in our community 
but Swedish decided to take a step further by identifying our community partner organizations, those who are represented by black and brown individuals in our community, as well as those that are fall into the symptomatic um, 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 era or symptomatic ways that COVID was um, uh, uh, responsive. So it we um, uh, had the, our coach go out to communities to screen and test individuals, many of the homeless shelters, um, but we went to the senior services center. We went to the Somali health board. We went to the Latina commu Latino community. We also went to every tiny house village supported by low income housing and had our coach there to screen and test individuals. Um, we had uh, many of our caregivers um, were reassigned to this, this particular uh, outreach um, entity. And uh, we had a medical director and many, many supportive clinical staff to provide these screenings. And I just wanna call one out. We went to Tequila community and uh, partnering with the Somali Health Board. And we tested 79 individuals in the Somali community and 12 individuals tested positive. And that was a direct response to having this type of uh, outreach to communities that are underserved. Uh, we also had interpreters that uh, really uh, eliminated or stopped the spread of COVID in this community just due to the screening. So uh, again, my team truly pivoted. We looked directly um, and based our relationships, uh, responded to the community need. And we feel that um, this was a kind of a proactive uh, response to provide this type of care to our community partners. Um, I will also layer that with our PPE donation. And so uh, many of the donations came into our hospital and many of them doesn't necessarily follow the manufacturer's requirements. So our supply chain donated thousands and thousands of masks and gloves and gowns um, and hand sanitizer and wipes that we were able to donate directly to our community partners. And the need was high and we were able to um, uh, fill that need or fill that gap with PPE and so community members can feel comfortable and confident uh, living amongst each other as well as greeting each other. And then also going out to grocery stores um, and also providing that barrier in education with regards to um, um, the spread of the COVID virus. So it was a lot of work, I must say, but it was definitely fulfilling for us to make this change, make these changes in our internal logistics and operations to serve our community partners. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Sherry. I think when you know you speak to so many different areas of ways in which healthcare can support community partners and how we're kind of uniquely situated to be able to come together and and bring together community and resources. Um, so so thank you for sharing some of that. And we're really excited about all of the work that you mentioned and and some of the really creative ways that you've thought about kind of solving challenges as our healthcare providers hear about hunger and um, challenges that our patients are facing and, and really connecting them with those community partners. So uh, thank you. Uh, Joseph, similar question for you. I'd love to hear a little bit about what's happening in, in Portland and um, with the community health investment programs, how you guys have had to pivot. Great, thanks Amy. Can you hear me? We can. Great, um, so I just wanna start off by acknowledging Aaron and Rachel the things that we do as a community health investment, as a community health division within Providence are completely dependent upon our partners. If you listen to the breadth and depth of what Aaron and Rachel could describe about the communities that they serve, that's not a depth of knowledge that we can have as a, as a health services provider directly in our business. And we rely on community partners like Rachel and Aaron to bring us into the communities. We, we act as hopefully an enabler to those individuals and organizations. So I want to just put that context out there um, in terms of our community health investment. Um, so within days of the, the COVID starting, um, what we did was we took about $700,000 in what was currently in the community with grantees and basically said to them, you know, we understand that your needs are maybe different in your organizations. And we completely made the, 
that money to be unrestricted for them. So any grantee was able to come back to us and say, yeah, we want to be released from essentially what we were intending to do with our grant prior. This is our plan with that funding going forward. And then we were able to quickly review that and release funds to um, a, a broader perspective of what a communication needs. So that was what we, we took as a first kind of line of defense with our community partners. Um, from that point, it also allowed us to reach out to each of our community partners, as Sherry talked a lot about, and find out really what the needs of the community partners were. Was it immediate cash flow? Um, for instance, uh, Project Access Now in, in Portland is a critical partner for Providence, Oregon, in terms of um, care of, of a lot of the same populations we looked at within community health investment. Um, they had to cancel their gala, which was about a week after the stay at home order got put in place. Well, if you know a lot about nonprofit finances, you've got a plan that says $125,000 is going to come in from a gala. It's just gone. Um, and so there was a lot of organizations that just had hold they needed to plug in terms of cash flow. And we wanted to know who those were going to be at the outset. But that also allowed us to listen to our community partners to see what they were seeing and experiencing within their own populations. Again, that close connection with Aaron and, and Rachel. Uh, so as we went through, we were able to come up with immediate short-term and medium-term needs that we were able to list in terms of our granting process because Providence, Oregon released another half a million dollars for relief grants. Um, and we were able to pull out between, it was you know the mid-March period and about uh, four weeks ago was our immediate term. And what we did was release grants that centered on food security, which included delivery of food and helping to fund meals on those people. Um, you know, a lot of their more um, communal dining areas had to be closed, and a lot of seniors that had to shelter in place. How do you partner with Meals on Wheels to make sure that happens? Um, whether that's with volunteerism, with providence, or funding mechanisms, which we were in, in both realms. Um, of course, shelter with the homeless and COVID-19 patients. We'll talk a little bit about the hotel programs that got in place later. Um, crisis management, and then to deal with social isolation and things like even utilities to keep people housed at the time. I mean, many of our cities and communities did moratoriums on evictions, um, which were very helpful in this, but there's also you know, a lot of things that kind of wrap around being able to stay in your house. So we looked at those as more short-term needs. Um, we also, within the, the granting process, were able to recognize patterns. Uh, and again, to go to one of Rachel's points about technology, this is, this shift that had to happen with COVID involved a lot of new and rapid technological changes. We noticed a pattern within applicants, and although we had you know, 28 applicants for a pretty small grant amount of half a million dollars, we were able to segment out those that were looking for help with technology, and then were able to provide, uh, I think it was eight different organizations, $7,500 that was specifically targeted at helping them come up with technological strategies and help them buy equipment needed to shift their paradigm in terms of how they're interacting with their populations. Um, we also put in place a mechanism with the treasury to be able to get money uh, through wire transfer to their individual organizations. Because if there was a cash flow and a median cash flow problem, we wanted to make sure their organization stayed stable. So rather than going through our normal AP processes, which you can imagine as large institutions aren't exactly uh, on a daily basis, we were able to get people money within a week of uh, actually happening. Um, and finally, just moving into the, the idea with um, housing and hotels that were put in place in terms of COVID positive patients and people under investigation. Um, we learned very quickly that trying to set up your own hotel is a difficult task. Um, we tried to do that in Washington County. The components that are involved with, with cleaning, sterilization, security, food delivery, it's, it's a it's a little village essentially that you have to create um, and that partnering with the county was the right thing to do and it's just because there are a lot of people that have already done a lot of work towards that end and um, us being able to provide a hundred thousand dollar block grant to Multnomah County which then we were able to work on and standing up those facilities where Providence was able to concentrate on what its areas of expertise were funding of course we were able to provide um, medical staffing through people that were furloughed or, or laid off through our system because of the reduction in actual clinical care that was going on. Um, and then able to provide testing throughout the facilities too. But that, uh, because Portland and Oregon in general didn't have anywhere near the surge that was predicted, that 
set a framework though for us. I mean, even though there you know, was only maybe 100 people placed in those hotels overall, we now have a framework to work with the county and a public-private partnership to be able to stand up something like this very quickly. So um, I think that's kind of one of the lessons we have to take from how we pivoted as a health system to the community is that we now have a framework to do so. Yeah, and I think, you know, what you speak to as we think about that power of partnership to solve long-term challenges that exist in our communities, um, of course, we know that there's no no great crisis without great opportunity. And we have some really incredible opportunities um, amidst COVID and coming out of COVID uh, to think about how do we further develop those partnerships and solve problems. Uh, so thank you for those examples and um, and and all of the different ways that, that you've really leaned into to solving these, these challenges. We have such great context here, and I'd like for us to go just a little bit deeper and, and to think about some of the stories that each of you have uh, experienced and seen amidst, um, amidst the way that the population needs have changed. And, um, and so whether that might be with, with the underemployed communities of color, um, farm workers, I would love to hear maybe a, a story or two about some of those challenges. And, and let's go ahead and start with our community partners. Um, Rachel or Aaron, would you like to share a story? Sure. Um, as I was listening to folks, I was remembering uh, an encounter that I had with a family. It was in late March, actually. Um, she, she was with her two children in a hotel um, and she had been living in her car for a very long time and accessing one of our day centers. Um, and one of her children was medically fragile, so she was in a hotel and had been there for a few days. Um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, one of the pieces that we had to hustle and figure out was the meal preparation, um, how, to, how to feed so many people three meals a day. Um, we quickly, um, in partnership with some other organizations, started a GoFundMe account, um, and we're really quickly able to um, raise a few thousand dollars. Um, and what we decided to do was hire a hire a few caterers who were going out of business um, and really needed that business right then. And, and we were only able to hire them for you know four and a half weeks. That's how much money that we raised. Um, but you know it, they they were really grateful that they were able to continue to, to still employ their workers. Us. Um, so. My, one of my things was when we first did this, I, I delivered the food. Right? So I just went to different hotels with me all day and I knocked on doors um, and I provided them what was this beautiful hot meal that was lovingly prepared for them. Um, and the mom, she was just, she just cried that when I gave her this food and, and it was, it smelled delicious. It was like mashed potatoes with butter and I could smell it. And her children were so excited to get such a wonderful meal. Um, and she was crying, just saying that this was such a terrifying time for her and her kids, um, that they didn't really know what was going to be next for them or what was going to be happening. And, and I just spent a little bit of time talking to her girls and uh, they were saying they were having a lot of fun bouncing on the <laughs> bouncing on the beds in the hotels. But I thought about how stressful that is for a mom to handle two two little girls in a hotel room. And when she said that she had been feeding her family cup of noodles for three days and that this was a hot meal for them, it was just really warming to see, you know, something as simple as a as a lovingly cooked meal given to somebody at a time. I mean, it's it's nutrition, but it's also comfort and it's showing showing them that a community of people cared about her and her family. Um, and that that story sticks with me because it, sometimes it's the it's the big moves of, you know, moving shelters. But sometimes it's the small things of saying, like, how, how is your family doing right now? And and you're doing a really great job um, in, in, in handling all of this stress. Um, and that family is, is still with us in our hotel. They've been one of our families that have been with us the longest. Um, but I'm happy to say that next week they're actually going to be moving into a more permanent housing solution. So while all this crisis management has happened, our, our regular work continues and that good work of getting people off the streets long term. Erin, so. thank yeah. you for sharing that story. Um, for many of us, we don't have the opportunity uh, to connect 
with the families that perhaps we might be on one end trying to provide resources for. And it's just really, um, it's really wonderful to hear about the the compassion that you have put into the work that you do and um, and how that impacts an, an individual family. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that work. Rachel, I know you have lots of stories and would love to love to hear a story or two as well. Sure, I'll talk um, about sort of a family in a different circumstance. Um, we do a lot of care for people with substance use disorders at our organization. And one of our big programs is um, a place called Hooper Detox, which is the longest, it's the largest sort of freestanding detox facility in the United States. And it, thanks to PPE donations from Providence, we've been able to keep Hooper open during this time, even though it's also a congregate setting. Um, we're seeing actually a rise in um, uh, people coming to Hooper during this time um, and actually sort of more complex polysubstance use. Um, so we had an individual show up um, needing withdrawal management from heroin um, as well as from methamphetamine. Um, again, we're able to screen these folks now because of support from community partners and have PPE. And this individual screened positive for COVID-19 just on the basis of symptoms. So um, instead of saying, sorry, you know, you can't come in because of the work that Providence and others have done with hotels, we were able to within the same, you know, within a few hours coordinate for that individual to go into a hotel. He couldn't go home to his family because he lived with a lot of other folks um, and there wouldn't be place enough space for him to safely separate himself or separate other people in the family. Um, so he was able to get to a hotel in that same day with some technology support. We were able to equip him with some technology so that he would be able to communicate with his family um, while he was at the hotel for a couple of weeks. Um, and then through the use of uh, <clears throat> sort of teleconnections also and some support from some uh, peer outreach workers, we were able to do withdrawal management with him um, for heroin and methamphetamine as an outpatient, um, delivering medications and sort of talking him through it day by day. So I think it's a real testament to all these different nodes in the system um, coming together within a couple of hours for someone who was in a pretty acute situation and would have otherwise been, um, you know, turned away or even back to the street. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, so many, so many different populations that uh, have unique needs that the programs have to be really tailored for uh, to to meet those needs. You, you know, Rachel, I and, I and I know we're we're nearing the end of our time, but I I, uh, I wanted to also um, invite you to share a story that you shared with me earlier um, about uh, the delivery of the comfort kits oh, and yeah. uh, and and upon being able to share some of those kits with with community members. Um, would you mind sharing that story as well? Sure, I'll give you a couple quick ones. Um, again, for folks who don't know, these comfort kits had dental, they had hygiene supplies, toothpaste, toothbrushes, snacks, activities for people to do. And I think overwhelmingly people have been struggling with not having enough to do, um, whether they're in um, recovery housing or in a detox facility or even on the street, um, and also feeling isolated. So the kits both told them, hey, here's something to do, but also your community is thinking about you and cares about you. Um, two quick stories. We actually had a woman who came into our detox program and then went right into recovery housing, um, was much more isolated in that housing than ordinarily we would like. Um, and the comfort kit meant the world to her. She actually did the entire puzzle book over a weekend. Um, mm -hmm. Under the best of circumstances, early recovery is really, really hard. And just having that connection meant a lot for her. We have another program also supported by Providence called the Recuperative Care Program, which is more on the medical side. It's for individuals who are in the hospital um, and can't be discharged to homelessness. And they come into um, housing with us um, and get um, medical case management, housing, um, access to medical care, um, and ultimately transition into other housing. And uh, these are often folks who've spent a lot of years on the streets. 
and they loved the cards. So there are many funny stories of the RCP clients playing spades um, at six feet distance and then kind of gambling with the snacks and actually <laughs> being able to build um, connection and some levity with those. So I thought that was a pretty creative use of the kits as well. No, I love hearing about that. Thank you. Yes, uh, we had a, a fantastic project led by Melissa Tiberio to provide comfort kits for families and individuals in quarantine and isolation and uh, volunteers going around to all of the dollar stores and team members collecting cards and um, and things to go in those kits. And, and it really um, warms my heart to hear some of those stories. So thank you for sharing those, Rachel, and, and for being such a great conduit to get those out to the community. Uh, Sherry, you also had some stories about, about comfort kits and the uh, and, and partnership with Seattle Storm. Would you mind sharing some of those? Yes, yes. Um, so Swedish has a partnership with the WNBA team, um, Seattle Storm, and our relationship is community-based, as well as we also support the, the um, players with our uh, physician, clinical care, as well as marketing communications. So because the uh, season has been on pause, they have been reached, we've been working together, providing education and outreach opportunities to our community. And I mentioned the comfort kits that we will be donating the cloth masks and supporting uh, getting identifying community-based organizations. And they said, we're in. Mm -hmm. So the storm provided $5,000 to the three organizations that we've identified, which was Plymouth Housing, Community Lunch on Capitol Hill, um, and the Tiny House Villages. So when we um, delivered those um, comfort packs, I they were unable to be there, but I did bring a storm banner with me and was at the Tiny House Village on Yesler, uh, Yesler Avenue. Uh, so I went in and I'd like to introduce and engage myself with the residents that are there. And so there was a, a family of uh, two girls and a, and a mom. And um, so we took a couple of photographs and I opened up the comfort kit and showed what was in it. And the little girl just, her eyes popped open for the um, word search uh, book that was there and said to her mom, mom, you know, um, school is winding down. I want to try something new. And so she actually was so happy to have the word search book because she looked at it as extending her education and more a different opportunity for her to continue to um, um, self-educate and also learn more. And, you know, those word search games, they are, can be challenging. And I think it could be, it was a great opportunity. And she embraced that as well as her mother embracing um, that uh, outreaching, uh, an outreach for extended education. So it was just a heartwarming opportunity for us to engage the Seattle Storm, Swedish Providence, and the Tiny House Villages. And, and again, the content of the bags were um, much needed um, and much um, appreciated by the population. So we provided 300 um, comfort kits for the Tiny House Villages, 200 kits for um, Plymouth Housing, and then we provided bulk items for Community Lunch on Capitol Hill because they provide hot meals for um, homeless and um, uh, house, uh, homeless and um, food insecure individuals in the Capitol Hill area. So it was again, again a great welcome um, opportunity for everyone to receive these comfort kits, as well as an additional financial support from the Seattle Storm. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful, another fantastic example of partnership. Uh, being able to leverage all of the gifts that each of our institutions bring and being able to bring along additional partners. So, so thank you for that advocacy and, and all that work. We are at the end of our time, but we absolutely have to get around to a call to action. Um, I'm going to invite each of you to just share one or two thoughts you have about how, how we all can lean into um, the, the needs of our time, the signs of our time, as the sisters would put it, and, uh, and with compassionate care, uh, respond to the needs of some of the, the vulnerable populations. Uh, Joseph, let's start with you. There we go. Um, I just keep saying to people, do something different. Just do something different. Uh, I think a lot of the things we've been doing over the past few decades aren't working. Um, 
there's a lot of methodologies and, and excuses we use for inequity in our society. And what we're doing is not working. So I despise this term, think out of the box, but it's time to do that again. Mm -hmm. Do something different. Um, yes. Keep your goals in mind, but do something different to get there. Yeah. Thank you. Erin? Yeah, in line with the do something different, um, you know, I just want to say that I think that there's a real opportunity to really transition all of our congregate shelters to a, to a you know, a private or semi-private place of sheltering people. Um, not only do we know that it's what's required to keep our community safe, um, but I think it's also just a much more dignified um, and loving way of, of treating all of our neighbors. So, so really just moving away from that mass sheltering. Awesome. Thank you. Rachel? Thanks. Yeah, I mentioned to you earlier today, Amy, that um, here in Portland, we find ourselves in three simultaneous declared states of emergency. Mm -hmm. We have a state of emergency around homelessness. We have a state of emergency around the pandemic. And we have, it's not declared as such, but really a state of emergency around um, the revelation and pain of uh, racial inequity. And I think doing uh, moving forward requires a few things of us when it requires education and good analysis, good power analysis and good understanding of root causes. And it, un it entails a sustained set of actions um, and then it entails accountability. And I'm thinking about this as this is not a project. It's not, you know, a five year plan. It is a way of being and that we may be the architects of work that we may, may not see the results of because of um, the path that we're on. But I think um, committing to it as a way of being is, um, is the call that I'm feeling and our organization is feeling now. Thank you, Rachel. Sherry? Yes. Um, so I actually wrote this down. I just wanted to make sure I hit each point. Be present in, a, in your community, be present. Um, allow yourself to be um, one one to one and engaged. Listen to the need. Listen to the greatest need from our community partners. Be innovative and be creative. We want to be make sure that we're not limiting ourselves to what the status quo has been. Move outside of the organization's comfort zone. Not only your comfort zone, the organization's comfort zone, and leave behind greatness. I think the opportunity for us to make an incredible change in the dynamics of our community is now. And uh, the high value of our work is present. So that's what I feel is the most important thing for us to do uh, moving forward in this time of COVID, in this time of Black Lives Matter, and in this time of uh, our uh, economy. And I see down here, Amy, you said vote. I feel that that is the most important tool that we have. It's a personal tool. We need to use that tool to vote. Thank you, Sherry. You all filled me with so much hope as I think about how we can all lean into our communities, better respond, better really create relationships with the vulnerable amongst us. Each of you have shared in so many different ways um, a, a call, a call for us all to take action, to be present, uh, and to respond to the needs of, of the most vulnerable. So thank you for joining. I appreciate each of you. And uh, I hope to have a have a deeper conversation with each of you on these topics, because my only regret is not to give you more time to speak about all of these wonderful topics. But thank you for the time that you've given and, and the incredible work to which each of you are dedicated. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to support. see you, Joe. Good to see you. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, so. And thank you for joining us.